waar die wolgers weer gespreid, door een boom sy skaar is vry, soos ons groei en kindigheid, mag u ons vry. Sien ons hoe hier, lei met die hand, laat u sien dus voor ons vry. Strong streams united flow Every curse stands proud and tall As we learn, we trust, we know God is in control Bless us, O Lord Guide us with grace May Northwest be blessed always Dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening, Huyanant, Tepane Monate. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this special occasion, the inaugural address of Professor Mark Rathbone. In particular, I would like to express a very warm welcome to Prof. Linda Duplessis, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Planning and Operations uh, from the Van der Bell Park campus. Prof. Natasha de Clerc, Director of the School of Management Science, Deputy Directors of the School of Management Science, Prof. Alfred Enrico, Prof. Marius Botgitter, Prof. Renier Janssen van Rensburg, Previous Director of the School of Management Sciences, Prof. Grizel Els, the Acting Director of WorkWell. Welcome to colleagues from all three campuses, friends, family, and especially his father and mother, Basil and Edith Rathbone, his children, Michaela and Isabella Rathbone, friends from Caneo, Johan and Elizabeth Marnitz, Casper and Olivia Fenter. Today is a proud and joyful occasion for the Faculty of Economic and Management Science of the Northwest University and all of us present. Inaugural addresses, are an essential complement of the university's public events program, helping to create a broader awareness of the latest developments in research in the faculty and the broader university. It also provides the platform for the university to showcase its academics, introduce them to the academic and non-academic community of the university, and allow engagement with the general public. The inaugural ration of professors is a special occasion which newly appointed full professors are induced into office. It is a significant milestone in any academic career. It is an opportunity for them to inform the colleagues in the university and the general public about their research journey and update colleagues of the current and future research directions. The Faculty of Management Sciences is privileged to have five staff members presenting inaugural addresses this year in various disciplines. Prof. Mark, tonight you can celebrate a significant personal milestone with family, friends, both previous and current colleagues. This inaugural address allows the university to recognize and showcase your academic achievements. Tonight, you will share your research interests with colleagues within the faculty and more broadly. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I've had the privilege to work with Prof. Mark as a member of the EMS REC, and now in a different capacity. And in preparation for the address this evening, I had to read up on Adam Smith and his valuable contribution to economy, capital growth, and wealth creation. And it was quite interesting. Um, I've read through some of his um, publications, and what I like is the very catchy titles of, of the papers that, and it, it means that you are really creative in how you engage with your discipline. So tonight, uh, Prof. Mark, we are looking forward to your address, A Genealogy of Business Ethics and the Relevance of Adam Smith. And at this point, I request Prof. Alfred Enrico, the Deputy Director of the School of Management Science, to introduce Prof. Mark Rathbone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Linditz and Prof. Rathbone. Thank you very much for the invitation to introduce you tonight at this very prestigious function where we celebrate your achievements. Mark Rathbone was born on the 17th of July, 1972, in Port Elizabeth, the eldest son of Basil and Edith Rathbone. Both parents played an invaluable supportive role in his life by teaching him and his brothers, Lorne and Basil, the importance of tenacity, balance, beneficence, contemplation, contemplation and faith. His father, Basil, was a banker for more than four decades, and Edith devoted her life to provide for her family with a loving home. Mark's daughters are the joy of his life. Michaela is a student at the Northeast University, and she's an accomplished provincial, provincial hockey player and dedicated sports science student. Isabella has on numerous occasions competed nationally and internationally as an acrobatic gymnast and is currently busy with a secondary education. Mark's education journey started in 1979 at Grens Primary School in East London. And he later also attended Paardekral Primary School, Fairlands, Kenmare in Gauteng, and also Lorraine Primary Schools in Port Elizabeth. He matriculated from Pearson High School in 1990, where he received the Top Achiever Award for Academics and Sport. Mark st started his tertiary education at the Nelson Mandela University, formerly known as the University of Port Elizabeth, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in arts in 1993 specializing in languages, psychology, and philosophy. This was followed by his master's degree in theology, which he obtained with distinction in 1997. Mark received a PhD degree from the University of Stellenbosch in 2006. In 2011, he enrolled for a master's degree in philosophy at the Northwest University, which he completed with distinction in 2012. During his doctoral research, he, also, he was also a visiting researcher at the Frey University at Amst of Amsterdam and also a visiting lecturer and researcher at the Bishop's College, Senate of Serampore University at Kolkata, India. In 1996, Mark completed his colloquium doctum for ordination in the church, and in 1998, he was ordained in the congregation of Montclair in Durban. He accepted a position at the Andrew Murray Intercultural Congregation in Swane in 2004 and Oswalkop Congregation in 2008. In 2011, he started lecturing at the School of Philosophy of the Northeast University, while he also held a part-time position as a reverend at Caneo Ministries. In 2013, he was appointed as a lecturer in the business ethics at the School of Management Sciences of the Northwest University. We are still working, Mark. <laughs> Mark was promoted to associate professor in 2019 and to full professor in the beginning of this year in 2023. Mark has produced 30 publications, among which 22 are in accredited journals, five chapters in internationally published books, and three in textbooks. 
His publications mainly focus on socio-ethical themes relevant to the South African context and business from the perspective of the classic economics of Adam Smith, and we look forward to hear more about that tonight. His research related to Adam Smith has been recognized nationally and internationally through numerous conference presentations, publications, postgraduate examination, and journal reviews. He is a member of the International Adam Smith Society and has been invited to present a paper at the prestigious International Conference of the Adam Smith Society at St. Andrews, Scotland in July of this year. His research has also benefited his teaching and learning, and he received a Teaching Excellence Award in 2016 in acknowledgement of his creative and engaging lecturing abilities in business ethics. His leadership in teaching and learning is clear from his mentoring, administering, and coordinating of business ethics at the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. He is also the editor of a textbook on business ethics that is widely used in Southern Africa. The second edition of this book will be published at the end of this year. Mark was the promoter for three PhD studies and four master studies, of which two were awarded in with distinction. He is also currently involved in the administering of research ethics and is the chair of the Research Ethics Committee of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences and the deputy chair of the Inter-Faculty Committee for Medium and High-Risk Research and we know it as Emilton Rec. Mark is a dedicated athlete and completed five comrades. Don't run away tonight, Mark. Okay, <laughs> which he earned, which earned him two Bill Rowan medals for completing under nine hours. He also completed two two ocean mar marathons, for which he received the Sainsbury Medal for each completing under five hours. And apart from that, he also completed more than twenty other marathons. Now, those of you who don't know, marathons are forty-one kilometers. He has also attempted acting. Can you believe it? I don't think you, act, you attempted. You actually did acting. You were an actor. He attempted acting and was invited to play the reverend in the well-known African soap, soap opera Seven de Lan in 2011 and 2012. I know what we're going to do at the end of this year at our final function. Anyway. He was part of the Phoenix production team that was awarded an SABC contract in 2012 to shoot an alternative Good Friday service for the SABC, where he was the creative director and main speaker. Now, this production has been aired on numerous occasions on SABC channels since 2012. He also made a short inspirational video named Texture in 2012. Mark also served on the boards of many NGOs and public organizations related with inter intercultural interaction, economic justice, HIV AIDS, and poverty alleviation. In this capacity, he provided leadership as director and produced numerous popular publications and newspaper articles. Mark is a firm believer in the goodness of life and people. The gift of life is to be enjoyed to the fullest even if you sometimes rush in where angels fear to tread, as long as you learn from your mistakes and never give up. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mark Rathbone.
Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Dean, Deputy Directors and Director, Director of Workwell, it's a great honor and privilege to be here and also welcome uh, fellow colleagues, professors, and friends, distinguished friends who play a big role in my life. It is wonderful to share this evening with you, to be with you, celebrate with you. And I see it as a great opportunity just to share something of my life. And Alf, a marathon is 42 kilometers. <laughs> It's that last kilometer <laughs> where you really need friends. <laughs> thank you for the kind words. Uh, Prof. Verona, also thank you very much for the kind words. Prof. Tuplessy, thank you very much for being here. I know you have a busy, busy schedule, uh, but it's wonderful that we can all share this time together. Well, I decided to share this evening with you, uh, some of my work I've, I've, I've done over the last uh, mainly 10 years. But when I started going through uh, the paper I wrote and, and the presentation, I, I realized the influences were uh, far beyond the last 10 years. I've only been involved in business ethics for, for 10 years, but I've been involved with theology, philosophy, and also ideology critique and a little bit of ethics, uh, uh, secular ethics, but mainly theological ethics, and that turned into secular ethics later. So, so there were a lot of influences in, in my life, and, and I just wanted to share some of these influences with you and also explain to you uh, the background why I am sort of got involved in Adam Smith, because everyone asks, that's many years ago. It's like the, the 1800s, uh, before that, uh, and, and how can that be of, of any interest, anything that came out of the 18th century? So I want to explain to you why uh, I, I, I got involved in, in this theme, but there's also a very important economic and theoretical and philosophical reason why I, I started reading Adam Smith and more critically reading Adam Smith and engaging with Adam Smith uh, through dialogue, through uh, contemporary philosophers and, and contemporary thinkers as well. So that's where my th title comes from, A Genealogy of Business Ethics. Uh, so I want to go back. And I, I found a lot of commonalities with, with other stuff I, I, I did. And also then the relevance of Adam Smith. To start off... Uh, most people have a very vague idea of business ethics. And, and the, uh, most perceptions about business ethics is about the things we read in the paper. And the things we read in the paper is extremely negative. <laughs> if you, uh, and and I, I have a couple of friends who stop reading the paper because they say it's a negative influence on their lives and, and they want to be more positive in, in, in their lives. So they decided... We don't read the papers. But if you read the paper, you read about corruption. You read about uh, scandals. And in South Africa, there, there, there are many scandals we, we, we can refer to. The latest one, the Steinhoff scandal, was probably the one that affected most people and most pension funds the most. Um, so I think it's important that we just define business ethics uh, b before we start with the uh, genealogical discussion of, of what business ethics is. And I think that there are three uh, aspects or dimensions to, to business ethics. The first aspect uh, is ethics in business. And this is sort of the general idea we have. This is sort of what we read in, in the paper and the scandals we are aware of. And business in our ethics in business goes back many, many centuries. It is sort of part of where economics started from. Uh, ethics and uh, economics and business was sort of, uh, there, there was a synthesis between the two and an engagement between the two. Uh, and, and that changed later. Uh, when business ethics became an academic discipline, but it's a fairly young academic discipline. 
It's only in the uh, second half of the 20th century where it became an academic discipline. So it's actually a very young discipline. And that's why it's so excited for me to be involved in business ethics. Because it's a young discipline, you are still learning um, how this discipline uh, is going to take shape in the future. And you can have a great influence on the future of this field of study uh, because it is still a field of study that's in the process of development. But the history does go back very long. And then there's institutional business ethics. That's even younger. Um, I think the, the high point of institutional business ethics uh, globally was the UN Global Compact, where Kofi Annan, um, the Secretary General of uh, the UN, uh, presented uh, the whole idea that business and ethics, that there should be a closer relationship. And the way we do business, the way companies function, that that should be done in an ethical manner. And this influenced the way governments function, state-owned enterprises function. And as we are talking, you can immediately think but, and say, but that's an oxymoron, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> and people who teach business ethics are probably morons as well because they don't know it doesn't work. <laughs> so, uh, so that's where the excitement comes from, uh, from for me because business ethics has this very negative image. We are only dealing with a lot of corruption problems and moral issues. And it's all bad. And we're highlighting this and trying to fix everything, but it's really not going to work because that's not the way business functions. Um, so that's the reason why it's such an exciting field for me, because there's a very positive aspect linked to business ethics, um, a, a positive contribution to business and also ethical development. And that's why I want to just continue to the next slide. And we find this when we, we, we look at the foundations of business ethics. And the foundations of business ethics goes back to the whole idea of economics, oikonomia in the Greek, and ethics, ethos in the Greek, oikonomia, uh, management of the household. It's not, a, it's not about companies. It's not about businesses. It's about the way we live our lives and how we manage our lives. And if you think about a household in the ancient Greek culture, a household was uh, a very mixed household, various generations living together, trying to make, make sense of their lives, not only trying to survive. There must be food on the table. There must be security for, for people living there. Um, so it's this whole social network. And if you look at economics from this perspective, immediately it opens up. And then you understand why ethics is so important. Because ethics is about customs, practices, the things we do every day. So how does the household function? Um, how is the household run? And therefore you see that there's a very close relationship between what we understand as economics, if we go back to the ancient Greeks, and ethics. And that this relationship is sort of the foundation for, for business ethics, if you go back. But things started changing. <laughs> through the Dark Ages, through the Middle Ages, up to the Enlightenment. Uh, before that, the Renaissance. And into the Enlightenment, people said, well, we can think for ourselves. Uh, and that's where science also came from to observe empiricism, to see what's going on around us and take in information and also rationalism to think about what we are viewing and what we are experiencing. And that brought about a, a big change. And that's where Adam Smith comes from, from the Scottish in Enlightenment. Uh, and he published a work, a lesser known work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1759, but he wasn't famous for that. No one knows that book, actually. And then after that, he became famous. And he became famous for the book he published in 1776, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And there the split came. Because Adam Smith developed an economic science, and he separated it from ethics, his moral sentiments, or that was the perception. Until recently, uh, 
many German philosophers still believe there's a Das Adam Smith problem. Um, and the Das Adam Smith problem is there's an incompatibility between his two works, as if he separated his moral philosophy and he separated that from economics. Economics must be laissez-faire, non-interventionist. Don't get involved in it, government, state. <laughs> Don't get involved in economics, ethics. Don't try and put us into a container. So therefore, um, there was this view that there is this disjunction, a, a problem. And this problem started not with the Greeks. It started in the Enlightenment with Adam Smith. Or that was the perception. Today in business ethics, this perception continues. And I tried to explain it with just a couple of references on, on the board. In 1993, it goes back as far as that. Uh, an article was published by Andrew Stark, and the title was, What's the Matter with Business Ethics? And the question came after research that he did with business people. And business people said, this thing, business ethics, is not working. What do you mean with business ethics? Who's Plato? Who's Aristotle? Why are they important? We have to run a business. And how can we run a business if we have to sit and philosophize? We've got deadlines. We've got uh, product lines to, to get going. So how can we sit and wonder about what we are doing and read about all these philosophers when we have pressing issues, practical daily issues? And that's where this idea came from. And, and, and this perception, I think this perception still lives today. And I find that mostly when I speak to the, uh, because once a year I do a, a research ethics course with the uh, MBA students. And they always, when I start, I, I try and make a couple of jokes, obviously, just to, so that we all feel comfortable with one another. And then they say, ah, oh, ethics, that's weird. <laughs> but the longer you talk to them, those same business people say, sure, this is actually so important. Because if we think about it, this is the problems we have every day at the office. The issues we have with corruption that we experience every day. If we continue, I mean, it was not only business people who criticized business ethics. We also found a lot of ethicists who were quite outspoken. And one of them is Warden. And he said business ethics is this very, very stupid discipline because it, it fails to see that they are making a naturalistic fallacy, a naturalistic mistake, actually. And all that it means is what you see is how things ought to be. So he said a lot of business ethics people have sold out. So they do research, they do empirical research. So we do our interviews, we do our questionnaires, we write up our data, we make certain conclusions, and then we say this is how a business should be run, and he says that is not very philosophical. And the philosophical problem is that philosophers are people of the future, <laughs> and people of the future cannot just look at the present and then figure out what must be, what ought to be, what are the morals that we should should uh, follow. So there was resistance from the one side and also from the other side, but I also quote the other one from business ethics people themselves, 2022, in the very distinguished journal of business ethics, in which it's extremely difficult to publish an article. Um, they had a centenary uh, edition and they asked a lot of business ethics people to write an article together. And guess what's the title? Business versus ethics. Thoughts on the future of business ethics. <laughs> so you can see it is a bit not very intelligent to uh, study business ethics, <laughs> to lecture business ethics, and do research in business ethics we, because we are conflicted. So... Um, what we know at this point is that uh, contemporary business ethics is a very young discipline. Uh, it's only starting out, actually. The other thing we know that there's a relationship between economics and ethics. Today we know that relationship is in a disjunction. 
And I want to just say one or two things about disjunction because it's a very important word for me. This junction in the English language is uh, recognized by the word or. Conjunction is and. So disjunction or, uh, but you get two types of dis disjunction. You get an exclusive disjunction. Now exclusive disjunction, I find a lot of my students actually uh, know this exclusive disjunction very, very well, but do not understand the, what it actually means. Because it's, it's sort of the idea, if your student tells you, um, I was studying last night, or I was sleeping. Um, for example, John was studying or sleeping. So we know if John was uh, studying, he was definitely not sleeping. So if John was sleeping, he was definitely not studying. But my students are, are very intelligent and, and, and very creative, so they usually tell me I study a bit and then I sleep the studying into my, my brain, into my being. Okay. And then I explain to them, but this is an exclusive disjunct. You cannot, cannot do both. I know your brain processes thoughts and stuff subconsciously, but you're definitely not studying. Studying is when you actually have the book in front of you. So there's a big difference, yeah, okay. But you get another disjunction, and the other disjunction is an inclusive disjunction. An inclusive disjunction is like, for example, Sally and John played soccer. It's a gender-neutral team. <laughs> Sally and John played soccer. So is it possible for both of them to play soccer in the same team? Of course, yes. So both can be true at the same time. And the argument that I follow, and what I'm following in my research as well, is that yes, there's a disjunction in the work of Adam Smith, and that's where the disjunction in business ethics started. But this disjunction is of a very special order. It's not an exclusive disjunction. It's not only economics without ethics, or ethics without economics, like Warden said. It could be both together, but in a tension. And my argument is that that tension is a critical tension, and we find it in Adam Smith. And my argument is it's extremely important for business ethics for the future. And if we do not develop this inclusive disjunction, business ethics is going to get lost or just be swallowed up and not mean a thing for the future of business, for society, and even for, for ethics. So when I say I'm referring to a genealogy, it's a critical historical overview of what is happening, or what happened and what is happening today. And I think this is important, this investigation. It's important because it can help us to get insight into the type of disjunction that Adam Smith followed, because we barely understand it. It's only the last 10 to 15 years that research has dawned to say that there's an inclusive disjunction. We had made a mistake. It's not the Das Adam Smith problem. This is probably the future for business ethics. And we need to investigate this further to understand how it can help us for the future. If we think about the ge genealogy, and I'm not going to go through this in depth because I mentioned some of this already. But if you think of the genealogy, genealogy is basically the family tree. What's the family tree of business ethics? Where does it come from? But there's something else to it. it, it it's a critical view of the history. How did things develop to where they are now? What went wrong? What went right? What are the problems and what are the challenges that we can develop? So if we follow the genealogy and we start in the pre-enlightenment, we have to start with Plato. That's the first philosophy book I ever read. Uh, it was actually, you know, Socrates never wrote anything. Plato wrote everything. <laughs> so it, it, it was the dialogues of Socrates um, when he had to drink the hemlock. Uh, and he decided to do it himself because out of his firm beliefs that, that he had. So Plato was sort of one of the first Greek philosophers, we can go back even further, but I don't want to bore you too much. And he said that economics is needs-driven. We need certain things, 
And you know what? He developed the whole idea of the division of labor. We need certain things and we need other people to help us get those things as well because we cannot do anything. Then we continue to, to Aristotle. And yeah, we can see his ethics, actually, his virtue ethics, where, where Aristotle actually said uh, we, we need things and, and we need economics because economics are the things we do to live a good life, to live well. And, and, and from there, um, the whole synthesis, that first slide I showed you, the interaction between ethics and economics was, was set. And that only developed further. We have Corpus Christianum, the fourth century, with the church and the state amalgamated. We have the Roman Catholic Church and we, we, we have the, the Roman Empire. And that amalgamated, and the two were, were basically one. And the economies of those days were feudal economies. And, and uh, people didn't speak much about wealth, the church fathers neither. Uh, St. Augustine said there are two worlds. It's this world, where, where the, the world of economics, and you better do things good, yeah, because God is watching you. There's other world, and if you know, don't play your cards right, the other world will be missed. So there are these two worlds, and the one world is the ethical world, and this world dictates what happens in this world, but we usually get it wrong. So, so be careful. You need a lot of grace in, in this world. Okay, and then, then they go further, and we find the Protestant era. And yeah, we find a good example, the, the research of Max Weber, that focused on the influence that Calvinism had in certain countries where capitalism developed. Why? Because Calvinists work hard. Has ever, anyone ever said you'll never die from working hard? Today we know you will. <laughs> you will die from stress. <laughs> But those days, they just said you work as hard as you can. It helped the economic system. It helped capitalism to grow. So during these times, there was no critique of, of the economic system. It was something we bared, and we tried to do as good as possible. We had our religion. We had our culture. We, we had these philosophical ideas to guide us, and the two were intertwined. There was no problem. You don't need business ethics. It's there anyway. And, 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 and this time was a time where, where ethics in business was, was sort of the clearest. Then we find the splits. I, I said a lot about it earlier. It started with Adam Smith. His whole idea was that um, we need to move past the times, the pre-enlightenment times. The times where uh, the monarchy decided and dictated how the feudal system should work, paying taxes. Uh, only a, a little minority of wealthy people at the bottom, the rest of us just, just work and, and pay taxes. Because you never own land, you rent the land from the monarch and the people who are in his favor. So a minority have, have, have this power. And so, so there was a massive split. And Adam Smith said, the in invisible hand is what dictates how economy should work. Other people cannot decide. It works by itself. And this was followed by the economists that followed. And therefore, the split between economics and ethics took, took place. And this was followed by Ricardo. He took up some of Adam Smith's labor theories. Utilitarians, uh, they said they, they were ethical. They, they had this idea of the greatest good. But you can sort of sit with a calculator and work out what is the best thing to do. We don't actually look in the eyes of people when we decide what is good or look at the context. It's, 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 it's a multiplication sum that, that we make. Uh, by the way, economists love utilitarians. <laughs> and then we get Karl Marx. And Karl Marx was also a figure of the Enlightenment. And he took Ricardo's theory and he twists it upside down because Ricardo said, uh, you cannot determine value only by what you do. So if I work for two hours, I, I have purchasing power for two hours. He said, you have to go and check what the raw materials cost, how much it costs to, to, to get those raw materials and the labor involved in all of that. And that also needs to determine the Karl Marx said, ah, I got you. Now I understand how capitalism works. You don't pay the laborers. <laughs> Because you need the resources, you need all the other stuff, 
So pay the li laborers as little as possible, and he turned Ricardo's theory into a theory of exploitation. But, you know, Adam, uh, Karl Marx is an interesting th figure, and, and I think we need to read him a bit more. <laughs> Uh, because he was a very important transitional figure between the Enlightenment and the post-Enlightenment. Because Karl Marx figured it out that this split that took place is not beneficial for society. And therefore, today, we have negotiations for wages, even academics, sort of, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> we have negotiations. There are trade unions. Uh, and that all comes from that idea that, that the economy cannot just function unilaterally. There must be communication. There must be dialogue. Ethics needs to get involved. And Marx's ideas was followed by the Frankfurt School, the German school uh, that, that followed his work with critical theory. Uh, if you think of Adorno, Horkheimer, Habermas, all these uh, philosophers followed Marx and said, we have to be critical of where we are. And we need to transform what we are busy with. And of course, the great figure that always denied is a Marxist, Maynard Keynes, was also the father of macroeconomics, but he was influenced by a little bit of Marx because he said, uh, the economy cannot just function uh, and we cannot leave everything as it is we need to get involved, and he believed that consumerism needs to drive economics. Before that, Ricardo and them believed you just produce a lot of things. There will be something, someone to buy it. <laughs> so if you make a lot of toys, someone will want those toys to play with. But he said, well, if they don't have money, they're not going to buy the toys. And Maynard Keynes figured that out, and he said, well, let's stop that. Let's intervene in the economy with macroeconomics, and I mean we're doing it up to today. <laughs> we are living proof of macroeconomics and probably also the disaster that it's going to probably sometime in the future bring us because things are heading to, 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 to a catastrophe, it seems. But let me not be a doom prophet. I said we start on a positive note and stay hopeful. Um, and then, of course, there was a big reaction against Marx. And that's why I think it's important to read him as well. Because the new liberal movement started um, with the, uh, the birth of von Hayek. Uh, Frederick von Hayek, yeah, during the Second World War and after the Second World War, they saw that communism is becoming a problem in the world. And they said, we have to resist communism. And so they decided to resist it through new liberalism, and new liberalism went back to, guess who, Adam Smith. They said, let's go back to our roots, and what is our roots? Our roots are Adam Smith, separate the two. There should not be intervention at all. There should not be engagement against the two. And the Italian uh, Polanyi even said, wow, this is going to be the liberation of the world. Finally, we are free from interventionist discourses. Then, of course, another stream in the post-enlightenment is business ethics. From the second half, that developed as a imp uh, applied ethics. So ethical theories were taken, like Aristotle, Plato, virtue ethics, Immanuel Kant, deontology, and business was thrown into this container to fit into it. And you can imagine what business people did. Stark told us, what is wrong with business ethics? How can they expect us to study these things? And then, of course, the last couple of years, research in Adam Smith and his relevance of, in business ethics took off. Now, Adam Smith is important. He's a father of economics. He had an influence on the Enlightenment. He had an influence on the post-Enlightenment. And my argument is it follows a inclusive disjunction with a critical engagement. And I quickly just want to explain what I mean by that. One of the big ideas of Adam Smith is the invisible hand. He said, don't get involved in the economy. There is a system going. And you know why he did it? It was his critique of mercantilism. Because cor corruption is as old as the world. <laughs> There was corruption between the mercantile classes 
and the British state. And he, he knew this. They were fixing prices. And one of the great problems was ordinary people weren't part of the economy. They weren't benefiting. So there was injustice. And he was critical about this. So his economic system was a direct uh, result of his critique of what went on in the economy. It was an ethical response. From there, and we know in his uh, inquiry in the wealth of nations, he focuses on self-interest. It's not the ben benevolence of the butcher or the baker. It's due to their self-interest that they bake. <laughs> they want to make money. But Adam Smith also wrote another book. And if we start reading that other book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, we find that he explains what self-interest is. He never explains it in great detail in Wealth of Nations. So he accepted that economists of the 20th century would read both books. And if they read both books, they would understand what self-interest is. Self-interest is not a license to greed. Self-interest is not a license to exploit without consequences. Self-interest functions within a socio-ethical system. And he called that system sympathy. Now, sympathy is not just sympathy. Oh, I feel sorry for you. But you know what? I was in grave danger the other day. I went through a terrible, anxious experience. I feared for my life. And now you're telling me you went through a similar experience. So I can associate with it. I have fellow feeling with you. And I can understand how you feel because I had a similar experience. But he says it goes much further than that. It also means that when we do anything, when we think and, and reflect on how we should react, and he said that's quite important to think about <laughs> how we react because mostly we're quite impulsive. We just do the first thing that comes to our mind, and that's why Aristotle also influenced Adam Smith so much. He said, don't be too hasty. Count to ten, at least, <laughs> before you do anything. Reflect. And he says, we all have that natural instinct. In our minds, it's sort of a cognitive process. And that's why Adam Smith today is a big influence of, on cognitive science and the science of perception. The way we think and understand. So we reflect in our mind's eye as to how we should react in a particular situation. I've been given a little envelope with money in it. And there's the contract. I can just sign it. What would the implication be? So I can start reflecting. So if everyone in this room knows I took that money, how would they react if I took that money? Would you think I'm a great person? Yes. Not. You won't. Allah, would you think I'm a good person? <laughs> or you're a bit shocked. Shocked to silence. I think my mother disagrees. She just shakes her head. <laughs> so in our mind's eye, we have this impartial spectator. We view ourselves through the eyes of other people. And we critically scrutinize what we are busy doing. And if I'm busy being corrupt, or I'm busy being self-interested to, to the point where I take advantage of other people, that spectator will stop me. So listen to what you want to do here. What are the implications? Because you know what? Everything always comes out. <laughs> you cannot hide anything. The implications, and I would like to end here, just shortly. I think the importance of Adam Smith for business ethics, it's in terms of the communication it creates. It's not a strange philosophy of, or ethical theory that are forced down on business people. It's something that business people know. Business people know our idea of self-interest. I have this business, I have a responsibility, I want to be good, but I have to make the business work. So what must I do not to get fired and still be a good person? I think that's the big question that business people, because I don't know many business people who are really bad people. They are just in very bad situations. And they have to make very difficult decisions. 
And Adam Smith understood that. He wrote a lot about that in the theory of moral sentiment. So it brings about communication once again between ethics and economics, but in a different way, a critical way. I ask myself the question continuously, what is the spectator seeing that I'm doing in this particular situation? The second thing is analytics. I think the, one of the biggest uh, scandals in Africa was the Steinhoff scandal. The board of Steinhoff had some of the greatest business minds in South Africa on that board. They were great business people. They ran great big banks and big companies. But there was no business ethic analytical skill to question what was going on. And that critical skill, Adam Smith understood, because that's what he did in the inquiry of wealth and nations. He questioned and he took everything apart. And as he took everything apart, he could see what was going on. He could understand why the mercantile system didn't work. Today, the board of Steinhoff says, but they didn't know. But they didn't apply the critical skill that was necessary to see what was going on in the situation. Thirdly, context was everything to Adam Smith. Uh, the impartial spectator works within a particular situation. It's not about some mystical abstract situation. It's here and now with the problems we have here and now, with the business problems we have here and now. How to keep the company in the black and how to function ethically in that situation as good people. Uh, so what is the context? And, and I think, yeah, Adam Smith helps us to understand uh, personal context, the micro context of, of we as business people in a situation. Also the meso context, how we engage in our environment. If we think micro, the, the business culture of organization. Steinhoff had a moral culture. The, the morality was not the issue. Transparency was not the issue. Making the business grow was the issue. The share price rose from 20 rand somewhere 2010 or before that to 90 rand and then fell to, to, to a couple of cents. So you can see where it ends at the end of the day if you follow that, that strategy. But it also says a lot of our culture in South Africa and Africa, where we work with a, a, a communal culture and a communal influence. We work with Ubuntu. Uh, ask Standard Bank Tanzania, they had to change their business strategy because <laughs> they didn't understand the communal culture and how decision-making works in that culture. Very important. And I think the big elephant in the room is, is our whole colonial history. If you think of the macro culture, Adam Smith dealt with those things. Then organizations, uh, organizations always say, we cannot be ethical. We are not people, <laughs> we're an organization. But there are people working in an organization. I know some theorists, uh, Finch tried with the agency theory, say, well, agency theory is important. You work in the company. We are shareholders. You work for us. <laughs> you are our agents. Uh, that didn't work <laughs> because what did uh, shareholders want? Profit. So they were always worried about the profit. Not that it's bad, but sometimes it's so short term that it puts the company and its future and its stability in jeopardy. And then the last thing, our teaching and learning. What's the content of what we're teaching? Are we teaching the critical engagement skill? And then our canon. <laughs> Is it Plato, Aristotle, Immanuel Kant, uh, Bertram, Bowles? Why are we not teaching the theory of moral sentiments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. I would like to thank tonight uh, the Northwest University for, for this function. Um, and FEMS, uh, Faculty of Economic and Man Management Sciences, and my school. The director of my school, the deputy directors of my school, uh, Marius and uh, Natasha. Thank you 
Verona, thank you very much, Pro Verona. Elf, you get a special place. <laughs> Prof. Elf, I really want to thank you for all your support through this last two years. Um, and, and going through the process, I really appreciate it. Uh, for your guidance, oh, your, your WhatsApp messages, <laughs> um, you won't know what, what it meant. Thank you very much. And, 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 and thank you to the school as well for supporting my application as well and supporting me through this time up, up, up to now. Uh, I, I really, really appreciate it. And Krizel, you, you are my new acting oh, director of WorkWell. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the support as well from, from, from WorkWell. You've supported me greatly and also for, for this trip. <laughs> uh, Prof. Renier, thank you as well as, 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 as director, but, but you have a special place. <laughs> uh, in 2013, Prof. Renier, I believe you went looking for me. I know you went, went you didn't go looking for me specifically, but you went looking for someone. <laughs> And, and, and thank you for, for believing in me in that time um, and giving me that opportunity. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for your faith in me and, uh, and also the, the promotions I, I went through. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Donnie, I'm going to mention you. <laughs> Donnie... Uh, Don is a special guy. Uh, he's, he serves on, on our REC, on our Research Ethics Committee. Uh, he's a no-nonsense person. He will tell you if it's not right. <laughs> thank you very much for that, and thank you for honoring us, me, to be here to today and representing uh, our, our REC as well. And uh, Prof. Linda Duplessis, thank you. I did say thank you in the beginning, but thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you in terms of the university as well. The university has sort of become a home to me in various ways, and uh, it's been a kind home. And I would like to thank the university. I want to thank you for, for, for being here as well. Um, then, all my colleagues. <laughs> I want to thank you. The last couple of months, year, the last two years, everyone asked me, how are you doing? How's it going with the application? Good luck with the inauguration. You know how nice it is to get, uh, to walk through our uh, passage, you hear laughter, smiling faces, everyone greeting. Wow, thank you. And thank you for, for all your support. You are amazing. Um, and your support was truly amazing. Thank you very much. Also, my colleagues from philosophy, thank you that, that, that you guys are here and, and, and also supporting uh, me in this and, and celebrating with, with us today. I, I really appreciate it. Um, before I forget, no, I will leave that for, for a bit later. Um, I, I want to thank Esme. And I want to thank uh, Shantae. They're there at the back. I know what, don't know why they're always there. They should, should sit. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, all the WhatsApp messages, support through the um, interviews, everything. And thank you. This is a beautiful all. Thank you for, for what you did. I, I, I'm just a man. So I said, keep it simple. I, I don't know. <laughs> And, but you did a wonderful job. Thank you very, very much, Esme. And Esme is a very special part of my life as well. She was part of my first appointment. Uh, do you remember Prof. Renier? I think she was in the interview. <laughs> she was there. She did all the administration. I went to the buildings there, uh, the institutional buildings, and she did everything for me. Thank you very much for journeying with me, Shantai. Good luck with the baby. We're all looking forward. Um, today I want to, from our school, I, I want to single out our support staff as well. Not as well. <laughs> we won't be functioning if it wasn't for them. I, I want to thank Rochelle specifically. We've been working together from day one. And then Mandy and Jackie. Mandy, you came along the last couple of years. Thank you for all your help and, and assistance. Jackie, you too. Thank you. 
immensely. Uh, I always run into their offices with some problem and they just said, don't worry, I'll sort it out. And they sorted it out, thank you. Lerato, thank you for being the announcer. <laughs> and I love your outfit. <laughs> um, then I would like to thank Kaneo. Kaneo is a very special place in my heart. Uh, it's my spiritual home. And tonight, as representative from Kaneo, is Casper and Olivia. Uh, Olivia. Olivia is my second mother. She's, uh, don't mess around with her. She will put you in your place very quickly. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't take any nonsense. And then, uh, Johan. Thank you for everything you've done for me in, in the years and your support in Elsabet. I, I really appreciate it. My parents, uh, Papa, Mama, Bye Danki, Ali Yaris Ongersteening. Thank you very much for standing with me through all my various journeys <laughs> and all my adventures as well. I really appreciate it. I love you and appreciate that you are here this evening. I know it was difficult and you had to travel and everything. I really appreciate it. And then my kids, Isabella, Michaela, thank you for understanding when I have to leave for a couple of weeks <laughs> for a conference and I cannot take you with. Uh, thank you for, for being uh, supportive and the children you are. Nyanu, thank you for helping this evening. I appreciate it. Uh, Prof. Beth sent his apologies. I had a meeting with him last week. Uh, he wanted to be here, but he's overseas. Uh, I just want to thank him for his support as well. And then one of my big friends, uh, Professor Anay Farouf, couldn't be here today. Uh, he is uh, overseas with studies. Uh, but we did speak today and... Uh, I just want to acknowledge his, his influence on, on my career and his friendship and support. Um, and then Prof. Herman, who couldn't be here uh, this evening due, due to illness. Lastly, I want to thank the Lord God, my Savior, and his spirit, Moya, that dwells within us. Please bow your heads in silence with me for a couple of moments. The Lord make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it's in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Good evening, colleagues and friends of family of Professor Rathbone. It's my privilege to congratulate you on behalf of the Northwest University in this milestone in your career. And it's indeed the highest academic promotion that you can achieve at a university. An event like this is a reason for celebration, but I think you will agree that it's also an inspiration to all of us and to your colleagues and your students and all the people that you have collaborated with. I was at your promotion interview, and what really impressed the panel at the time was how well you could articulate your field of research and the confidence 
with which you spoke about your work and also the plans that you still have for the future. I also want to extend a congratulatory message to your family. Um, without their support, you would not have achieved what you have. And just reading your CV, you can also see that family plays an important role in your life. So you have every reason to be proud of Professor Mark tonight. We also know that at an event like this, we really see the tip of the iceberg. We see the results and the publications and the achievements, but what we don't see is this much large, larger bottom of the iceberg, all the evenings, all the conferences, all the work, all the funding challenges. And we know that a lot of hard work preceded a promotion like this. Um, but I think tonight you also gave us a glimpse that in this complex world, it's so important to look at the world through different lenses. And you have given us a bit of a lens of how to view ethics and business and philosophy through the lens of Adam Smith. And I'm sure that these perspectives help others to look at business and solving the socioeconomic problems we face. But um, Professor Rathbone, with being a full professor, I think comes more academic freedom, but also more responsibility because the position of a full professor, as I said, is the highest academic position, but it's our professoriate at the Northwest University that needs to contribute to the vision, to the direction, and to the success of the discipline, and ultimately to the success of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. In FEMS, we have 41 full professors from a staff complement of 310. If your father is a banker, if you do the sum, he will tell you 15% of the staff has reached this milestone of being a full professor. So that, I think, says something about the nature of the accomplishment. And Jonathan Janssen said, university ceases to exist when the intellectual project no longer defines its identity, infuses its curriculum, energizes its scholars, and inspires its students. So, Mark, we are glad that you chose the Northwest University, as you call it, a kind home, and we wish you all the success with your future. I think we can now all stand for the singing of the national anthem. After that, you can remain standing when the procession leaves the hall. Professor Rathbone, you and your family are welcome to wait at the back uh, for congratulations from your colleagues. Thank you. <laughs> 